Mel Gregg, um, what an absolute pleasure to have you here today with me um, for One Degree with Lisa B. Welcome. Well, you're my friend, girl, of course. <laughs> and I'm like, do we hug? I know, I think we do. Oh, my darling. And it is really <laughs> lovely to sit here with you as a friend because that's what this is about. Um, I have access to people like you as part of my friendship circle and yes. we have some amazing chats, so I want to be able to share that with everyone. So basically everyone can just eavesdrop on one of our conversations? Basically, yes. So we're all on the couch <laughs> together in our boots. <laughs> that's what I should have worn. I should have worn the yuggies. You didn't get the memo next time. But you are an amazing lady. And you came into my um, consciousness, I guess, at a time which was very difficult for you, and we'll talk about that. But I've watched your journey since then, and I gravitate towards people who take times of adversity and turn them into something positive. And that's absolutely what you've done. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's an absolute honour to have you here. Oh, but I want to start at the beginning, because you're yeah. in... Adelaide girl, yes. right? Yeah. Um, and I was reading up on you a little bit last night because we've talked about lots of stuff, but you don't tend to go back back to your childhood. No, you just... don't. When you meet people, you're not like, oh, when I was 16, yeah. I did this yeah. and it just doesn't What did you happen. do when you were five? Yeah. I, I played with Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I want to talk to you a little bit about the young Mel, you know, growing up in yeah. Adelaide, what you were like and, and what you were into. Well, I was a farm girl, so born and raised on the farm. If you ever need a, a sheep shorn or a cow milked, I can do that. <laughs> I can do all those things. <laughs> and it was such a different lifestyle, and I loved it. I absolutely loved being on the farm. And then when I was 13, we moved to Adelaide, which was the big smoke before then. Um, I was raised in a um, Nungunjeri community, so it was quite a contrast for me to go from such a small town mm to Adelaide, which was a big town. Yeah. Um, and I really found that that challenged me and I went on my first journey of rebelling because farm life, you can run around, you can do what you want. There's no rules, no restrictions, no real safety concerns. Mm. Move to the big smoke and my family could not deal with that. They didn't know how to protect me and they overprotected me. Did you have any idea about what you wanted to do? You listen to the radio, but you do not for a second think that you could be on there one day. I used to listen to the Hot 30 countdown on my ghetto blaster. It was pink from cash converters and it was the greatest thing I owned and I would stay up all night listening to Kyle and Jackie O. I then went on to host that show, which was crazy because 16 year old Mel did not think that that was a possibility. She knew it was cool and she wanted that, but she didn't think that was a possibility. Do you ever have moments on air where you think, I've run out of things to say? No. And you know what? I, <laughs> That's why I would be no good at it. I'd be like, oh, I've run out of things to say. Do you know, because people don't realise, like, you have to have such an active life, but you need to know how to identify content. And that's what it comes down to. What is going to relate to someone? And it could be the smallest thing, but you can turn it into something that's really relatable and a funny story. But you need to know how to identify it. And that's the thing. You would have a lot of stuff going on. You might just not know how to translate that on air. True. And you have a natural ability to turn something that probably on the surface is just day to day into something funny and engaging. And yes. I'd say it and everyone would be like, that was boring. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> no, not boring at all. <laughs> um, okay. So talk to me about when you hit the big time, if you like, yeah. in, in your radio career. Well, that would be the Hot 30 countdown. And to get to that point, I'd been working in radio for 16 years, going up and down on the roller coaster that is radio, getting fired, getting rehired, changing jobs, being in a job for three months and then being told you have to do a new position. Radio is tough. Like, it is a, a very tough industry, but it's very rewarding. And from day one, when I realised it could be a real job, the Hot 30 countdown was the mission. It took 16 years to get overnight to that success, point. Overnight success, huh? No, I worked hard. I wish I'm it was joking. overnight. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm like, no, Lise, it was very hard. <laughs> it took a long time to get to that point. So when that moment happened, I'm like, oh, my God, because I was 30 and the show was for, you know, 13 to 24-year-olds. But as you know, I'm very young at heart, so mm. 30 was just a number. So is that the time when you were put in a situation that unfortunately didn't turn out very well. Yeah, that moment and what happened obviously changed my life forever. Yeah, and this for me is the moment where you and I connect. Mm. 
because when you are hit with adversity in life, you have two choices. One is you can let it beat you. Yep. And of course you wallow in it for a little while. And I remember seeing you interviewed on a current affair, I think it was, yep. and my heart mm -hmm. broke for you at that time. But I, I could sense a steely determination in you and mm -hmm. you needed to go away and heal. And, yes. and I totally understand that. But you came back and you said something earlier about um, a passion to help people. Yep. And that's almost your life's calling. And what you have done since then to address what happened after the prank call I think is incredibly admirable and just just makes me love you so oh, can you talk about what you've done? Don't make me leak. Don't make me cry. Um, <laughs> in terms of um, hmm. the troll free day. During that one to two years of the story being at its highest I was trolled heavily like the most awful things and while I was in lockdown for that first three months with no communication with the outside world all I was reading what was was online and I started to believe that these were real people, that this is what the world actually thought about me. I'm going to gut you like the pig that you are, eye for an eye, I'm going to kill you, then I'm going to kill your mother. And I believed that I deserved to die after I read all of these things. So, and I'm a resilient woman. So imagine a child being told, go kill yourself. They are killing themselves because cyberbullying is absolutely out of control. One in four children are being cyberbullied. So when you've been told the worst things you can possibly imagine over and over again, you become resilient to it. Mm. I am now resilient. There is nothing anyone can say to me online that I haven't heard before, and it will never get to me. So I created Troll Free Day, which is a national day of awareness for cyberbullying. It's something that I fund. It's something that I work on as a one-man show. Can you tell me how it came to you, the name, and then the steps you took to actually get it up and running? You know, it was through um, a TEDx talk. I knew I wanted to do something with Troll Free Day. So step one, I just registered those domains. I'm like, I'm doing something. I don't know how this is going to work. Uh, at, to start with, I wanted to change legislation because we do not have tough enough laws in Australia. So you just started. Yeah. <laughs> just like, not ambitious. <laughs> I'm just going to change some legislation, then I'll buy the domain names <laughs> and maybe get a logo. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I wanted to, and I still do, I'd love to get that passed in Parliament, but there's so many other charities that have the money, that have some funding, that can fight for change, and they've got the teams. Will I, does it mean I'm going to stop doing that? No, but what am I capable of doing that I can control, that I can do now, and that's the awareness. When you've sat down with an 11-year-old and they look you in the eye and they say, I want to die, like it, it's not good enough. It absolutely breaks your heart and you feel you have to do something. And, and that's what I did when you talk to the parents that have lost their children. It breaks, it's just awful. Mm. What did you do in that time to build that resilience and come back um, feeling whole again, I guess. I think it was about six months after the prank call and it was, I was going through major depression. I'd never had mental health illness before. This is the thing, tragedy can happen, something can happen and you can crash and burn and you can't control it. Mm. But I got to a point where everything was so bad, the guilt for what I'd played a part in, the depression, the trolls and what they were saying to me and starting to believe it, I got to a point where I had to choose whether the suicide was an option or not for me. And in that moment, I thought about it, I go, okay, is this, is that actually, is that something I could do? And it wasn't, because it's never the answer. In it, but in that moment, you have to get to that bottom, and then I chose life. And when you choose life, you keep going. More bad stuff's gonna happen. My mum passed away. I had a cheating husband who is now divorced. You know, bad things are going to keep happening to you, but you just learn to deal with them and you build that resilience every time something happens. And it's true, you don't know how strong you are until every, the only thing you have is to be strong. And that's, that's when I learned how strong and how resilient I actually am. You mentioned legislation, and it's actually a really nice segue to something else I wanted to talk to you about, which is um, endometriosis. And yes. you're very vocal about the fact that you have it, um, about yep. what it means. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of women that are incredibly grateful for that because most people don't know. Yep. Can you just describe for us, like, a, a week with endometriosis or what it actually, what actually happens that... You know, when you're going through an episode, I guess, is that what you call yeah, it? Yeah, you do. It's a flare-up. Well, so you have endometriosis. There's no cure. It takes seven to nine years to diagnose. I'm a stage four sufferer. So for me, it not only causes extreme pain, um, I've got fertility issues now because of endometriosis. Not all sufferers will. But when I'm having an endo flare-up, I'll end up in hospital because there's no amount of pain relief that you can be given over the counter that can help you when you're having that flare-up. It feels like, and sorry for being so graphic, 
that a piece of barbed wire is being pulled through your reproductive system. Like you try and take a step and you've just, it feels like someone is stabbing you with a knife. And when it's on your bowel, the same thing. It's just such a horrific illness. And every time I've gone to emergency here, there's been another endo sister there. You can just spot them from a mile away because you, all you want to do is lie on the floor and try and make the pain go away. It really is such a horrible chronic illness. Mm. What are you most grateful for? Life that I chose life that day and that I've continued to live it to the fullest, to never give up when bad things happen. There's so many times I could have curled up into a ball these last couple of years. You know, this has been such a new blessing for me being in the Illawarra, but it's also been two years of heartache behind the scenes as well. Like, it's been really tough and, you know, I can sit here and go, poor me, I just want a freaking break. Where is my good karma? Where is... It's been, you know, five years of on and off pain and frustration and such a tough journey but I'm I know that it's happening for a reason I'm still learning there's still experiences that I need to have mistakes that need to be made things that need to be learned and that's what you need to think as well if you're going through bad times yourself just trust your journey it's happening for a reason and just remember that tomorrow's a new day and keep going so I'm grateful that I've got the resilience and the mentality to start the next day fresh and just keep going. I have this thing that I do um, where you find five words to describe yourself and you kind of use that as your filter. So for me, it's fearless, um, unique, honest, fun. And I always forget the fifth one, but I think it's... Um, Hot. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go with that, I like that one. But every idea I have, everything I do, I go, okay, these, this is the filter. Is it who I am? You know, can I, I make like this that. work? It's like your values, but just yes. in a word. Yes, really fearless. Nice. Am I fearless enough to follow this idea through? Is it unique enough that there's nothing else out there? Mm. Am I honest enough that I can be true to this project or what I want to do? And fun, well, that's just, you know, would I do something in politics? No. Politics is not. But fun. you do it on the periphery. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what that word means, but yeah, the outside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing oh. your heart and soul oh, today. Oh, I love you, Lisa. You. You're beautiful. I love you too. I love you more. I love you more. <laughs>